today I've got Rosianna here and we're gonna talk about how to survive your 20s. Cause we're doing it so far. Yeah, I'm, I am well into my 20s. How old are you? I'm about to turn 27 or maybe I'm already 27 by the time this is up. How old are you? 24. 24, she's still a noob. I'm she's big. figuring it out. Recently, Lucy, mm -hmm. Meow's yeah, Lucy, was asking people for video ideas and people asked her for a how to survive your 20s video and she's like, I only really just started my 20s. Then she recommended that maybe we could do it. And so here we are. I've got a list of topics to run through. Obviously we can't cover everything. We have very particular experiences experiences of our 20s as being, you know, white women in London most of the time. Yes. Apart from when we moved to Indiana. Let's do it. First question is how the hell do you find a place to live? Imagine you've been living with your parents or you've been living in like uni dorms. Now you're gonna have to live on your own. Well, probably not on your own, actually. I think a lot of this actually comes down to financial planning a bit earlier because something that I really didn't take into account for was how much extra money I'd have to spend when getting a place. So I would have to spend, I had to find a deposit, I had to find all these extra fees, and really it came down to an extra, like, £2,000 or so on yeah. top of everything because you had to pay some rent in advance and there's just a lot of different things going on in a way that you might have experienced with uni housing but usually with uni housing some of that is covered already and the other side of it is finding if you don't earn enough money already if you don't have a high enough salary or if like us you worked in like the creative arts or well, like me in retail as well or like even you're a YouTuber and yeah. people are like what that doesn't what make sense that? that doesn't work for a background um, check you may need a guarantor and that is something that is also really worth planning and figuring out and asking if anyone would be willing to sign their name as your guarantor. Yeah, it basically um, just means you have someone that makes enough money to pay your rent. UK. Yeah, or in the UK. Or in wherever country you yeah. live in. But I, all, all I, we know about is the UK. Yeah, and so basically it just means that the company you're renting from knows that if you can't pay your rent, they have another person to go to to collect yeah. their rent from. So in that case, you won't, like if you don't have a job but you have like loads of money saved up, that's a way that you can steal. Because they don't care about how much money you have in your bank account. They want yeah. to know that money's coming in. But that was one thing that I feel like we weren't properly aware oh, of. No. But that's before you've even started looking for a place. I would say when you start looking, cast a really broad net and be realistic about what you can afford. Um, because obviously there are times when people can find bargains or people who have like maybe even priced their flat like really reasonably, mm -hmm. but more often than not, you'll find you have to really lower your expectations. Yeah, not everyone can live on Brick Lane. Very often you'll have to live a couple of zones out, but it might be a good decision because you have money to actually like do fun stuff in London, because it's one thing living in Central, but not having any money to do things. Yeah, as you said, talking to people um, is really, really important because people always know other yeah, people like who are use your network. Like whenever you're looking for either a job or a place to live, tell everyone, literally yeah. tell everyone. That's how you found this place too. Yeah, exactly. And because they know so many other people and it means you have a huge network even if you don't realize it. And then if you live in London or you're looking for a place in London, you're going to have to live with other people if you're starting out. I think the best thing to check is their lifestyle before you move in to make sure you're not moving into like a party house if you're not a partier, or a quiet house if you like to spend loads of time with your flatmates. Or just editing videos on yeah, YouTube all day. In a corner. Um, yeah, and then the other side to that also is when you go around to these places, there are lots of things that you should check when you're visiting. If, if it's a flat that isn't already um, you don't have a connection to especially, but also any flat you visit, you've got to check the water, you've got to ask questions about the boiler, and if you don't know which questions to ask, then look them up on the internet, that's literally what I did, and then I asked all the questions that I needed to ask. Whereas, yeah, it's very um, good at stuff like this. Just that you're, but all of those things are really important, because you've got to check that everything is safe, and you want to live somewhere that is safe. I also put in, because I find something quite interesting, living with friends, because we obviously Terrible. live together. Don't do it. Worst idea ever. <laughs> you get a totally different dynamic. Yeah. And in a way it's so much better, but then there's also things that are harder. And so we always made a cleaning schedule, mm -hmm. which we would just put on the door. And even if you don't exactly stick to it, it's nice to know that you know what your job is for that week. You know what you're responsible for. And it's the same with, we had to like share gas and electricity and stuff like that. Just to know that like when the gas runs out on whose door to knock. It's one of those things that whenever money comes into something, there is an added level of tension because everyone is in their own situation and everyone is figuring their life out and everyone has their own stress. And I think that living together is such a good example of showing us how we have to 
kind of consider other people's needs and, and consider what's going on in their lives and it's a really good way to do that. If you've lived with people at university, if you've gone to university, then you'll know that it can really change the dynamic and it can break some friendships apart sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I was living in houses at university where some of the people just didn't get along with each other and have never spoken to each other since. And so you have to have the conversation before you live together that like we, we have to be able to have conversations about things. Mm -hmm. We have to be honest about money. We have to do X, Y, Z and do the best that we can and we have to be able to kind of forgive each other and on some level for like the tiny little things that you do every day that annoy each other. My um, brother is living in sort of like a dorms more like apartment building situation at the moment he's living with two other guys yeah and they have like flatmate meetings oh nice and like they've that. just set up like once a month and they can just bring stuff to the table they're like by the way yeah you never do your dishes we should probably put some money together and buy a new shower curtain. So what would you say is the best way to address these things because I really like that idea I know that there can be sometimes like I think we did a lot over text and mm -hmm. that was how but sometimes those kinds of texts can be really like passive aggressive mm -hmm. in some house like when you have like a house chat and it just yeah. becomes like calling people out it, when there's a number of people living in that house you never want to feel like everyone else is ganging up on you because then you get just it's very hurtful mm -hmm. because as much as those frustrations can hit never roof, be passive aggressive it's just not healthy just you have to live there you have to live there and it's just not i think not i think one of the main things of being a 20 year old is like do not be passive aggressive it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. The next one mm -hmm. is two combined ones and it is looking for jobs and dealing with rejection. I know nothing about Often, that. often goes hand in hand. <laughs> yes, well, so we make these jobs videos on White Channel every single year and mm -hmm. it's not um, something that you'd like, an achievement you unlock and then it's done. Looking for jobs is an ongoing part of your life. I really, I know that Lean In is a questionable book in a lot of ways, but one of the things that I really took away from it is that, is not to think of careers as a career ladder, but to think of it as like a jungle gym. Mm -hmm. So where you can go sideways and you can sometimes take on jobs that are lower and higher and whatever. And I think when you start thinking of it like that, it takes the pressure off a lot because mm -hmm. there isn't that like timeline of like, well, if I want to get into this industry, then I have to be in this position by this time and that position by that time, I have to get a promotion by that time. And then when you, before you've even started applying for the job, you're already thinking of yourself 10 years down the line and mm -hmm. you just put so much pressure on yourself. You have to just take the pressure off and do the best you can. <laughs> Crab is like moving from side to side in jobs instead of moving up and down like a kangaroo. I think for me looking back on my job hunt it felt very much like an upwards journey even though it felt like I was falling into a giant hole. Mm -hmm. So with every letter you write you get better. That's true. And with every job you apply for, you're getting better at applying for jobs. And every interview you do, you get better. So even if you don't get those jobs, they have been a necessary step. So it's so rare for people to be like, I'm gonna apply to my first job and I got it because I'm great. No, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. No one knows what they're doing when they start off. And so I think seeing the applying as part of the process. And certainly in terms of rejection, um, where possible ask for feedback and if you have anyone who you can show a CV to, who you can show a job oh, yeah. application oh, to, yeah. absolutely do that because you'll be staring at a document for such a long time, your brain will explode. You might be the most meticulous speller in the world, but you will have misspelled your name. The next one is a big one. Money. Saving money. Budgeting. Being an adult and dealing with money. How'd you do that? Can you tell me? Because I have no <laughs> idea. When I was younger, I did a lot of spending. I lived with my parents, I used to go on holiday all the time. Then I moved to London and I thought, alrighty, if I don't have money here, I'm in a lot of trouble. So I always set out to have enough money to pay at least two or three months of rent and afford a new laptop because my laptop is like everything. And that makes it a sort of realistic goal. It's not just like a random sum of money. So one of my favorite YouTube channels at the moment is The Financial Diet. I don't know if you've seen no. that much. Um, it's a great, great YouTube channel. Um, it's kind of based on a blog. She talks there a lot about having an emergency fund and that's exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. She actually talks about having it for like six months, having okay. a, a bigger pot. Unfortunately, it's not always possible. No. So I came out from university and even before then um, I, with bits and pieces of debt and kind of overdrafts, especially after university, mm -hmm. I had an overdraft and I still have an overdraft, which is kind of like a hangover from university, really. At several points, I had credit card payments. I always made my minimum payment, which you absolutely must do, but I wasn't able to chip away at it in any substantive way, especially because living in London, it very much, money very much felt associated with being able to socialize and being able to see people and make yeah. the most of it. And I kind of, I struggle in isolation and there was something about spending money with other people that was kind of a ne necessary part of socializing because when you're making a budget make it realistic yeah make it like really take into account 
oh, I spend this much on the train. And then when I stop by the, the corner shop, then I spend this much on, I don't know, sparkling water and crisps. In any case, it's just helpful to know where your money's going, and you should know where your money's going, mm -hmm. because otherwise you find, oh, I've budgeted for so-and-so, but then this direct debit from Thames Water or whatever took this money out of my bill, mm -hmm. and I... I'm stuck and now I'm over my overdraft limit and now they're charging me £12 a day to just be over my overdraft limit and my credit score is going terribly and everything just feels like it's falling apart. Mm. So anything that you can do to regain some sense of control in it is fine and anything that you can do to stop yourself turning in on yourself as well about it because it isn't your fault, it's just you just have to make choices that are realistic to your situation. And I feel with saving as well, what I've really felt is as soon as you have a little bit of money saved, mm. it's really encouraging. You're like, okay, I'm saving. And then it's so much easier to leave that money in your bank account. At least that that's what it's yeah. like for me if you get like that first little hump. So we've got way more other topics to talk about, but this video is getting very long. So we're going to do a part two, which will be up very soon. And go subscribe to Rosianne's channel, which is youtube.com slash Rosianna for more life advice, I'd say. Lots of life advice There is quite a lot of life advice, mainly as I try and figure out my life. Mm -hmm. Do we? Hell me cool.